Welcome to church. church. <laughs> welcome to church. Hello and welcome to church. Whether you're new or regular, it's great to have you join us. My name is Paul McDonnell and I'm a member of Genesis, which is a Bible study group for young adults who are either at university or have just started work, like myself. Last week we were looking at Mark chapter 7 verses 1 to 23. I was really struck by the reminder of our great heart problem and that without Christ's great love and sacrifice, we would never be able to stand redeemed before God. So praise the Lord for he is good. This week we are looking at Mark chapter 7 verses 24 to 37 and I pray that we will all take something valuable from this sermon. After the service, it'd be great to have you join us for Zoom coffee which will, will be running from 12 until 12.45. I hope you enjoy the service. Welcome to church today. I apologize for my lack of facial hair after that introduction. But we're glad that you welcome, uh, you're, you're here, and we welcome you to be among us, as whether in person or online, Scattered or gathered, we come to worship God together, especially if it's your first time joining us, perhaps online or here in person. As you probably have heard, due to new lockdown restrictions, we are going to return to pre-recorded services for two weeks from next Sunday. From our perspective, this is not ideal. However, we realize that along with our whole society, we are facing a huge public health crisis. As part is loving our neighbor and respecting the authorities whom God has appointed over us, we will take our share of the pain shared across our community as together we seek to help bring down levels of COVID-19 infection. Yet surely in this crisis and in this latest restriction, God is speaking to us and calling us as individuals and as a society back to himself. We're reminded of our powerlessness and the fragility of our lives by this pandemic. And therefore we're drawn to see that our only hope lies outside and beyond ourselves. In the God of all power and wisdom and compassion, we turn to him to see in the gospel the God who sends Jesus to rescue the lost and the helpless from a far greater sickness than coronavirus, from the sickness of sin and its deadly outcome, death. So that by whatever means possible, we continue to proclaim this good news, which our society needs to hear and to believe and delight in. Hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, the prophet Isaiah spoke a word of hope to those who felt helpless and powerless in exile. The same words Jesus took up at the beginning of his ministry, and we use some of them now as a call to hope and worship the God of hope, even at such a time. From Isaiah 61, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Now further uncertainty has arisen this week in relation to singing in church and the potential that may have to spread the virus and the impact that may have on those who gather in church. As a result, while we seek clarification of that, we have with great reluctance decided that we should not sing today as a precaution. You may already have seen that in the email, but I just want to make you aware of that now. However, I encourage you as you remain seated and with your masks on to let your soul sing from your heart, even though your lips are silent as we watch together our first praise. Thank you. 
as thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have. unite our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, the God of all faithfulness, fill our hearts and souls today to praise you for the good news of the hope which you give us in the gospel of Jesus our Savior. For the more we see of him, especially in Mark's gospel, the more we want to praise you for the gift of Christ your Son. We praise you for the, all that he did and all that he does and all things well. He brought and brings a kingdom of hope and joy, coming to seek the least and the lost, to cast down the proud and raise up the humble, to tend our bodies and to bring life to our souls. He came and he comes to offer us a life that we could not live, a life of perfect righteousness given in exchange.
reading is taken from Mark chapter 7, verses 24 to 37. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. Yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was beset by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged him to place his hands on the man. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spat and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. At this the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Well, if you have uh, your phone or your Bible uh, with you, just please keep your um, finger in that, uh, on that page as we look at these verses together. We could think of Mark's gospel a little bit like a jigsaw. And as we read its pieces, what are we discovering? We're discovering that each chapter reveals another piece that fits in and a picture, a fuller picture about who Jesus is begins to emerge. And it's important to see the full picture because unless we see who he is, unless we know who he is, then we'll not be able to, to put our trust in him and to have our lives transformed by him in the way that the gospel invites us to do. Now we have to wait until chapter 8 before the disciples really get to see who Jesus is. And even then, there's so much for them still to learn. But every chapter we're seeing a bit more, and we see it more here in chapter 7. But sadly, those who were most blind to Jesus were those who should have been most clear-sighted. We've met them many times, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They knew their Bible and they were apparently the most keen to follow God, yet they were blind to Jesus. Last week we saw in the first half of the chapter how they opposed him, how they were taken up with the wrong issues, petty, useless things, and they couldn't see the wood for the trees. It's something for those of us who are familiar with religious language or religious ideas to be aware of. We've heard of Jesus many times, but we still can't see the wood for the trees about him. Remember, these Pharisees were, were those who weren't irreligious, but were seeking some form of religious understanding. But they couldn't see the wood for the trees. Now, there's two ways of doing that. One is in opposition, and, and one is seeking and searching for the truth. And maybe you're a seeker and a searcher after truth. You still don't see it yet. Well, that's okay. Keep looking. There's more to discover and keep praying that God will open your eyes or unblock your ears to see and to hear and to know Christ and to respond to him with full joy and delight. 
What are we going to see today? Well, we have a game of two halves here. Two people who meet Jesus and who really see who he is. And the remarkable thing is they're not the usual suspects. And you may be watching this at home or you may be here in church and you don't think of yourself as the usual suspect and maybe you think therefore the gospel is not for you. Christ is not for you. Well, be encouraged. God is often in the business of choosing the most unlikely people, the people we would never expect or the people who don't expect it of themselves to show that he is not limited by what we think is the right thing. No barrier can contain him. So keep looking, keep searching, be encouraged to look at these stories, see new things, unexpected things that we learn about Jesus and see and savor him as the great God and Savior. That's the goal of all that we're doing here. Not just that you'll know a lot of facts about Jesus, but that because you know these things about Jesus, you may be led to trust your life. And if you're already a follower of Christ, to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So two halves. First of all, a woman who would not be put off, verses 24 to 30. Now, the first unexpected thing that Jesus does in these verses is to leave Galilee and head off into foreign Gentile enemy territory north of that region to an area controlled by the city of Tyre. We're told that in verse 24. At the height of his popularity, when you think he would, he would move on out to continue to encourage his own people to follow him and to build his base, as it were, he goes somewhere where he's not known or barely known at all. Why is he doing that? Why would the Jewish Messiah go to Tyre, the Gentile place? Well, we're not told in so many words, but verse 24 suggests that Jesus is after some privacy. Maybe the crowds who are following him, the crowds are the problem. Perhaps he wanted to get away where nobody knew him, far from the incessant opposition, perhaps, of his own religious leaders. Maybe to spend time alone with his father in prayer. We've seen him do that already. Or provide some more teaching to his disciples, who, as verse 18 of this chapter has shown us, are still dull-witted as to his identity. But even far away in Tyre, even in a foreign place, his presence couldn't be kept a secret. If there were paparazzi in those days, maybe they followed him to reveal his private retreat, but it's, it's much more likely that someone spotted him, maybe someone who had been from that region to Galilee and to hear of his work. We read of people from Tyre doing that in chapter 3, verse 8. Maybe someone recognized him and the news got out at the, in the local square or at the, the local well and people began to seek him out. It's rather like Nicole Kidman staying at the Slave Donard. His arrival didn't stay a secret for long. And one person was particularly interested. Verse 25 tells us, as soon as she heard Jesus was there, she went straight to him. This woman was desperate. Like the woman who reached out to touch the hem of Jesus' cloak. Do you remember that in chapter 5, if you've been following these series? She reached out to Jesus because he was her only hope. In that same chapter 5, we meet a man called Jairus whose daughter was dying. And so this woman's daughter is in distress too, possessed by an impure spirit. And just as Jairus came and fell at his feet, so she came pleading for help. She didn't care about her dignity. She, wouldn't, she didn't care what other people thought of her. She needed Jesus. And she was not too proud to plead, if only, if only, Jesus, you can help what would Jesus do? Would he do for her as he had for Jairus? Go and help her daughter? Well, before we get there, Mark fills in a little bit of the background. Jairus was a, a well-respected synagogue leader of prominence amongst the Jewish community. This woman is, by contrast, a Gentile. She's described in verse 26 as a Greek. That probably indicates um, that although she was born in the area of Syria near the Phoenician coast, what we call Lebanon today, her language and culture were that of Greece. Maybe it indicated that she was of the cultural elite, someone of some social standing, and yet here she was on her, feet, on her face before a Jewish spiritual leader, all dignity cast aside in her desperation. Here was this woman, and your heart goes out to her. Surely Jesus would help her. So if you were writing Mark's gospel and you got to verse 27, how would you write it? 
What would you think Jesus would say? You remember this is Jesus full of mercy and grace and love. He'll have a word of encouragement for her, won't he? He'll have a word of hope for her. He'll, he'll say, yes, I'll do that, won't he? Well, if you're looking at verse 27, you'll find what he says shocking. He says, first, let the children, and he means by that the children of Abraham, the Jews, eat all that they want. For it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. And by dogs, he means the Gentiles like this woman. Did you see that one coming? That's an unexpected one, isn't it? What's going on here? The Jews of those days were not lovers of dogs or Gentiles. Dogs for them were not little fluffy, fluffy pets that you would get a, a calendar of and, and look at it all year round. They were scavengers made unclean by their feeding on whatever dead thing they could find. And the Gentiles were not included amongst God's chosen people. In fact, they often opposed them. So it wasn't unusual for Jews to refer to Gentiles as dogs. And, and still today, if you referred to someone as a dog, it, it probably wouldn't be regarded as all that complimentary. So why is Jesus saying this to her? Is he not being cruel or hateful? Would his Twitter feed today uh, have some kind of warning on it? Would he be banned indeed altogether for using racist language? We well, need to think, is Jesus in the habit of speaking like this? No, he's not. So why should he speak like this in this case? What is going on here? Well, I think as the rest of the story unfolds, what we see is that Jesus has the measure of this woman. And his words are an invitation to her to prove her faith. She was outside of the people of Israel. Had she true saving faith? Well, this has happened before. Do you remember uh, Naaman, the Syrian general in the Old Testament who was a leper? He went to Israel to Elisha the prophet to see if he would heal him. And he expected Elisha would come out and make a great fuss of him. But Elisha didn't even come to the door. He sent a servant with a message, go down and wash in the river Jordan seven times to be clean. And Naaman, the great general, was so furious, he refused. But then he was persuaded to obey and after doing so was healed and led to profess faith in the God of Israel. Naaman, is your faith real enough that you'll go and do this thing? So here's this woman, also from Syria, just like Naaman, is your faith real enough? Well, none of us know the reality of our faith until it's tested. But her reply shows that she had true faith, for she wouldn't be put off or deflected. Verse 28, she comes back, yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Yes, it's first for the Jews, but is there nothing for the Gentiles? Lord, I've come in faith. Can you not help me? This woman could see what the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who turned their nose up at the bread of the gospel that Jesus brought, that her only hope was Christ. He was able to do what no one else could do, and she would not be deflected. So although we don't have it pictured here, I imagine it's with a warm and joyful smile, Jesus says, go home, and you'll find a demon gone, and your daughter well. And that was how it was. Psalm 87 verse 4 promised that those born in Tyre, this same region, would be counted as those born in Zion. Means that they would be numbered by faith as amongst God's people, as if they just as much as they've been born an Israelite. And it was coming true. Here she was. She was just as much a part of the people of God as someone who'd been born in the land of Israel. Again, Jesus is doing the unexpected. He's showing that while the bread of life is first for the Jews, it's also for the Gentiles, which is good news for most of us who are watching this because most of us are Gentiles and not Jews. He is throwing open the doors of God's house that non-Jews like us may find ourselves within the kingdom that extends to every nation. The gospel is for everyone. It is for everyone from every nation, whatever our background. Whatever our privileges or our lack of them, there is no barrier to our coming to Christ. He will not cast us away if we come with genuine faith. All are welcome to bring their sin. All are welcome to nail it to the cross. All are welcome to find that the blood of Christ washes us clean from all unrighteousness. This woman came to Jesus, came to where he was staying, and she could have said to herself as she came up to the door, ah, this, is, 
this is no, this is nonsense. I'm wasting my time here. He's a Jewish Messiah. What, what's he going to have time for me, a, a Gentile woman? She could have got as far as the door and I'll not bother. I'll, I'll just go on. There's no point. Maybe that's how you feel. You know that you need your life to be changed. You know that you need the forgiveness of sins. You know that you need to find a purpose and meaning of life. You know that you need to leave behind the past and go on to the future with God. And, and yet you come to knock and you think, ah, but he wouldn't be bothered with the like of me. Would he not? If that's how you feel, take courage from what this woman did. Knock, seek, and you shall find. Don't stay outside the door. Knock the door. Come to Christ. Seek his mercy. He won't turn you away. She was a woman who would not be put off. Be a person who won't be put off in seeking Christ. And secondly, we see here, verses 31 to 37, a man who would never be the same again. So Jesus leaves Tyre and arrives in the Decapolis. Verse 31, that's 10 cities is what that name means. It's a, a loose association, a bit like the United Arab Emirates, and so not sort of one country, but all sort of different bits of countries all put together. And he, he goes that way. It's not the most direct way he could go, but he goes that way apparently to avoid going home again to this, all of this opposition and all of these crowds, presumably continuing to seek time with God and his disciples. It's not the first time he's been to the Decapolis. Remember again back to chapter 5 when Jesus cast the demons out of legion and uh, they left and went into a herd of pigs, as you may remember. Like Tyre, the Decapolis was Gentile territory. And perhaps the good news legion told others about Jesus had reached this area because when he got there, verse 33, a crowd begins to gather. And as in other places, the locals brought him someone to heal them. In this case, it was a person who was deaf and severely speech impaired, verse 32. And again, Jesus does the unexpected. Now, if Jesus had merely been a traveling miracle worker and showman, eager to break into the extensive uh, and, and lucrative Gentile market, he would have said, now, I just see this poor man here with this, he can't hear and he can't speak. I want you to come up here. Can everybody see him? Isn't this, isn't this a terrible condition? He's saying, look what I'm going to do. Look how wonderful I am. And by the way, on the way out, please, will you give to those baskets on the way out? Or maybe just give before. And just, just see what I'm going to do for this man. And Jesus doesn't do anything of that sort. Verse 33, he takes the man aside, away from the crowd. Did you expect that? Would Jesus not make a big show of this? No, he doesn't. And if someone comes to Christ, he's not going to make a show of you. He's not going to act in a way that will bring embarrassment upon you. He treats you graciously and with personal care because he loves you. You see, the more of you see of Jesus, the more you can trust him. You can trust yourself completely to this man, to this God. And Jesus again does something we do not expect. What had happened previously when he healed people, he had done so with a single touch or a single word. Or even by not being present at all. But in this case, verses 33 and 34, he's very hands-on. Why, why is he so hands-on in this case? Remember, this man is deaf and unable to speak. How is Jesus going to communicate him to him what he's planning to do? He goes and puts his fingers in his ears. He's, he's clearly indicating to him, I'm going to help you hear. He touches his tongue and he says, I'm going to help you speak. And perhaps the very first word the man heard was the tailing off of Jesus' command, be opened. His ears were opened. And his tongue immediately was loosed to speak, presumably rejoicing in his deliverance. You see, you can't put Jesus in a box. Oh, Jesus is going to do this, is he? Jesus is going to do whatever he likes. He's God. He's going to act in whatever way he needs to because he's God. He is free and able to do as he sees fit on every occasion. You see, you just, you just can't follow a predictability thing with God at all. It's, it's, it's so exciting to follow God because you never know quite what he's going to do. Not in a random way, but in a way that, that reminds us, don't put me in a box. 
Don't, don't, don't imagine that you've got God taped. God is bigger than our imaginations. That means he can do more than we could ever expect or imagine so that we'd never need despair. But it's also clear to us that we can't imagine or limit him simply by what we can think or do. God is greater than all our boundaries. Learn to trust him in every situation, no matter how dark it is, no matter how despairing it seems. Our God is greater. For the gospel is always full of hope. Notice again, hope here for a Gentile, not one of Abraham's descendants. This man had no right to expect the Jewish Messiah would help him, yet Jesus did it because he's not the savior of the Jews only, but of people from all nations. And as he returned to heaven, he said to his disciples, make disciples of all nations. And that remains the great missionary foundation of the church for each of us. Christ has his people in every nation. And we are called to be part of letting them know of his great good news. And if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that's a privilege that you have. You're involved in his mission. It's not an optional extra that he says. Do everything else. And by the way, at the end of that, if you have any time left over, wouldn't you mind just doing a wee bit of, a, of, of reaching to the ends of the earth? No, he says that's our central role. Have we forgotten that? Is, that, is, is, is mission just something for keen people? People who like that kind of thing? People who have a bit of time on their hands or a bit of interest in that? No, not at all. Jesus said, go make disciples of all nations. And we're part of it. Our part of it may be giving. It may be going. It may be praying. It may be telling. But it will be something. It can't be nothing. All nations, like this man and the people of the Decapolis, all nations. And yet, you might say to me, but should we be telling? Look at verse 36. Jesus says another unexpected thing here. He says, don't tell anybody what's happened. Now, he'd said that kind of thing a lot on the other side of the, the Sea of Galilee amongst his own people to, to dampen down their excitement of, and of him being a political leader. But on the other hand, Jesus had told Legion to tell his Gentile friends and family the good news. So what's going on? Well, it may well be that Legion had done such a good job that Jesus couldn't escape the crowds that followed him even among the Gentiles, leaving him no room for any time to be alone with his father or the disciples. So I think what Jesus is doing here is not a general command to us to say nothing, because we know from the Great Commission Matthew 28, go make disciples of all nations, that he's not saying that. I, I think he's saying a particular thing at a particular time to keep silent for specific reasons. So it's not, a, it's not a general thing to be silent. It is a specific thing at this time. We are to speak of him. But notice how this incident ends. Verse 37. The news about Jesus led people to be overwhelmed with excitement, and they say he has done everything well. Being a follower of Jesus, a disciple, is not an easy one. We've seen that in previous chapters. He's taught them about rejection and persecution. Yet for all the trials and difficulty, there isn't a single follower of Jesus Christ who cannot look back over their life and say at the end, he has done everything well. Wherever God has led us, whatever we have faced for him, Whatever we have endured or enjoyed in following him, he has done all things well and continues to do so. What will you be able to say at the end of your life as you look back? Having lived for yourself and followed your own desires, will it be, I did my best, made a few mistakes, up a bit, down a bit, but, you know, all right, not too bad. I did it my way. That's the number one song played at funerals in the UK. How depressing. I did it my way. That's all I've got to sing. I haven't got nothing to sing. I'm glad I'm not singing if that's the song that's there. Or will you be able to look back and thank God that he did the unexpected in your life? He extended his mercy and his grace to you. Yes, even you, even me. Changing your life forever and blessing you all the way so that even if the times were difficult, you will be able to say honestly and gladly, he has done everything well and I praise him 
and that even the best is yet to be as glory awaits. I hope it will be so. Amen. Let us pray. Lord and creator of all things, we come before you today in reverence and praise. We thank you that Jesus came for all of us and we pray we will learn from the examples we find in the Bible as we study and examine your word. As we remember the faith of this woman, this outsider, who put her hope in Jesus, we thank you for his compassion and willingness to help her. We pray that we too will put our hope in Jesus in every situation in which we find ourselves, safe in the knowledge that he will help us too. As we approach the season of Advent, when we prepare for the coming of our Saviour King, we recognise that it is also a time that generates many different emotions, from the joy of being with family to the sorrow of missing family members no longer with us. We pray you'll bring comfort to those who are grieving and reassurance to those who are missing being with family that this time will pass. COVID-19 has made this time especially difficult as we are limited in who we can meet and how we can greet them when we do meet. Help us, Lord, to see these days of isolation as a gift from you and a way for you to protect us from the disease. Inspire in us a desire to use this time to read your word and draw closer to you in prayer. We pray for those in the NHS struggling with the demands made on them as they try to help those who are ill with COVID-19 while still caring for all their other patients. We pray you'll give them the wisdom they need to make difficult decisions and the strength they need to keep going in times of stress and tiredness. We pray too for all those in the Assembly and the Government who are making the decisions required to guide our country through the difficult days ahead. May they have all the information they need to make those decisions wisely and in the best interests of all. As we turn our thought to others, we are mindful of this year's United Appeal, which reminds us that together we can do more. We pray for all the United Appeal projects but in particular Fresh Light that works to help people with mental health issues. And so we pray for generous hearts so that as a church we can make a big difference in our society here in Ireland as well as all over the world. We know that our Saviour has done all things well and so we pray that you will give us the courage and willingness to go and tell others of this good news not just here at home, but across the world. As we come to the end of our service of worship, may we seek to be a reflection of your love and to be a witness to others of your mercy and grace. In Jesus' name we pray, Amen. If you are in need of prayer for a situation in your life that is troubling, there are two ways we can help. Our prayer ministry team will pray with you one-to-one. -one over the phone because of social distancing, of course. Or the intercessors will pray for the situation for 30 days. Either way is totally confidential and you can request prayer by emailing prayer at notpresbyterian.co.uk or by phoning the office. within the sorrow there is beauty in our tears and you meet us in our morning with a love that casts out fear you are working in our waiting 
sanctifying hand went beyond our understanding you're teaching us to try your plans are still to prosper you've not forgotten us you're with us in the fire and the Fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.